Hello and welcome back to the screencast. This is Kirk Hendershot Kreitzer again. We're into part two of three on images and imagery. We've done an overview of um, this um, important foundational concept of formal aspects of poetry. Now we're going to be moving on to how images can be used and um, introduce um, literal versus figurative um, images um, to give you an idea of the different ways in which they can be expressed. Okay, so now that we've talked a little about images, how can images be used? There are a whole variety of ways in which you can use an image. Um, you can invite an understanding of someone or something through representative detail. You can provoke insight. You can convey, inspire, or enhance emotion. You can embody an abstraction or idea. You can communicate an experience um, rather than mere information. And you can help readers see the connections um, through patterns. Now I'm going to go into more detail on each one of those in order. So invite, provoke, convey, embody, communicate, and help. Okay. Representative detail. Here's an example from Seamus Heaney's The Forge. All I know is a door into the dark. Outside, old axles and iron hoops rusting. Inside, the hammered anvil's short-pitched ring, the unpredictable fantail of sparks or hiss when a new shoe toughens in water. Um, a forge has a lot of things going on in, within it. There's sights, there's sounds, there's smells, there's touches. All of the senses are um, represented in a forge because it's a big, complex place. Um, Heaney could have gone the route of describing every last thing um, in the forge as a means to bringing the reader into that world. That's a legitimate way to go. Um, a lot of poets do that. Um, essentially, they're list poems that um, that they're using. Um, Haney is listing here, but rather than listing everything, he's picking and choosing very specific details to give you um, a sense of the forge without having to describe every last thing in it. So it's almost movie-like in the way it focuses on one thing and then another thing and then another thing. It doesn't need you to show doesn't need to show you the whole thing because it shows you what you need to know to understand the world of the forge as the speaker understands it. And again, as you look at this, you'll see that there's nothing really terribly poemy about this sample. Um, it's clean, straight language. Um, it's not ornate or overwrought. Um, it's vivid. It's accessible. Um, it's pretty much pure imagery. Um, door into the dark, old axles and iron hoops, hoops rusting, Hammered anvil's short-pitched ring, unpredictable fantail of sparks, or hiss when a new shoe toughens in water. Each line actually contains at least one image, um, and in a couple of cases, more than one. You can use images to provoke insight, as in this example from Robert Hayden's Those Winter Sundays. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then, with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. In this sample from Hayden's poem, um, the first four and a half lines are pretty much just pure description, although there are little things that start to give you a hint about um, the nature of the father's work, um, the nature of the lives of the people in this house. Um, Sundays too. Uh, father got up early every other day, Monday through Saturday, but he did it on Sunday too, um, and with his cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, so we get the idea that he works outdoors, um, got the fires going for the house. Um, so you get an idea of the father and his life and the lives of the family. But then is where you get the real insight um, is when that last half line, um, no one ever thanked him. You get a really strong realization of um, not only the lives of the family, but the kind of retrospective regret that the speaker of the poem feels. Uh, this is a very t powerful um, use for imagery. Um, that line, no one ever thanked him, would not make any sense if it weren't for the images that precede it. Imagery can convey, inspire, or enhance emotion. Um, here's an example from Mary Howe's How Many Times. 
No matter how many times I try, I can't stop my father from walking into my sister's room. Depending on your own individual background, um, you're going to have different reactions to this. Um, I think one of the possible reactions is um, a, a disturbed or upset one. Um, it's conveying emotion. Um, I think it's also inspiring emotion. It's conveying emotion of the of the speaker, but it's also inspiring emotion in the reader. Um, there's nothing graphic going on in this, um, but the idea of the speaker having tried many times but never able to stop the father from walking into my sister's room creates a very disturbing, um, unspoken image in the poem itself. Um, and again, there's nothing fancy about it. Imagery can embody an abstraction. An abstraction is um, a big, complex idea that um, is hard to wrap a definition around, like uh, patriotism or love or sorrow. Um, these are things that are really good to avoid um, in a poem because they mean so many things and so many different things to so many different people that saying them doesn't really bring the reader of the poem into any particular kind of world. It brings them into their world, but not the world of the poem, which is, as a writer, what your goal is. Even this morning would be improvement over the present. I was in the garden then, surrounded by the hum of bees and the Latin names of flowers, watching the early light flash off the slanted windows of the greenhouse and silver the limbs of dark on the rows of dark hemlocks. The imagery is in lines two, three, four, and five. Um, the abstraction that it's embodying here, nostalgia, I want to be back at a better time, um, a regret, frustration, um, that sense of I really don't want to be here right now. You could say I really don't want to be here right now, but why? What's that going to help you with that? And, and getting back to that pleasant place. Everything after the first line is embodying the abstraction of the idea of it would be better. Um, why would it be better? Well, the poet actually has to explain it in specific um, tactile, visual, oral um, terms. Imagery can communicate an experience, um, from Ted Couser's Old Cemetery. Somebody has been here this morning to cut the grass, coming and going unseen but leaving tracks, probably driving a pickup with a low mower trailer um, that bent down the weeds in the lane from the highway, somebody paid by the job, not paid enough, and mean and peevish, too hurry to pull the bindweed. I went to the cemetery and um, saw that somebody had mown the grass. Um, yeah, that does the job. Um, but that sense of coming to a place and seeing that someone had been there and the notion that you don't really know a lot about this person, or maybe you do, um, but you can project this idea. And so you both get the kind of the poet's projection of who's been here this morning to cut the grass. Um, but also maybe um, a projection of the person himself, um, this kind of grouchy old guy, I'm assuming guy, who is in too much of a hurry to actually do a good complete job. He runs the mower around um, and in his crabby way heads off to his next job um, because he's not getting paid enough for it and so he's not going to take time to get the job right. Um, you get both the experience of the guy mowing the grass and the experience of the person um, who visits the cemetery after and looks around at this kind of hasty, get her done kind of job rather than a job that's been done well with the love and respect that you would hope you would find in a cemetery um, taker's work. Imagery can help readers to see connections. Um, here's an example from March Piercy's Barbie doll. This girl child was born as usual and presented dolls that did pee pee and miniature GE stoves and irons and wee lipsticks the color of cherry candy. Then, in the magic of puberty, a classmate said, You have a great big nose and fat legs. This helps um, readers to see um, the idea that um, the idealized world of a Barbie doll is in no way related, no way related to the actual real world of um, classmates, of kids uh, who are just, and you all know this, uh, can be um, ridiculously cruel um, in their honesty. The idealization of femininity versus the reality of a world that's constantly judging you for being anything other than um, magazine-like or doll-like perfection um, is what's brought up through the imagery of this poem. 
So that's what images can do. Now we need to talk a little bit about what images can be. Images can be literal and they can be figurative. Um, that's basically the two groupings for them. Um, a literal image might be her bright fingernails, polished red, um, or white lines on fresh blacktop. Those are both images. Um, they're literal because they simply describe what is in the world. Um, figurative images, um, her lips, hard as polished fingernails. That is not saying her lips are polished fingernails. It's saying her lips are as hard as polished fingernails. It is not a literal thing because they're not. Um, it's figurative. It gives you a sense of what her lips are like. Um, the idea of falling in love. You don't actually fall when you um, are in love, but that's how we describe it. It is not a literal fall, it is a metaphorical fall. Um, like the cats who are still roaming around in here, they're being surprisingly quiet. Um, when they were little, um, we nicknamed the commando kittens uh, just because they were just crazed. They ran all over the place and attacked from ambush and things like that. Uh, both us and each other. Um, are they actually the commandos? No, but it's a very useful figurative way of describing their behavior. And as soon as I put it up there and said, yeah, our kittens were commando kittens, I probably you as my listeners or anyone as a reader got the idea of the way they behaved. So images can be literal and figurative. Now, literal is not particularly hard because it's purely descriptive, but figurative is a little more complex, and so that's where we're heading now. Here's an example of both literal and figurative imagery um, from Wilfred Owen's Dulce et Decorum Est. Um, this is a poem um, written based on um, Wilfred Owen's experiences um, in the trenches um, during World War I. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of disappointed gas shells dropping softly behind. Now, there's a lot of um, figurative imagery going on in here, and I'm going to dig some of that out for you as we go along through this next section. But a couple of um, literal images um, that um, you get. Um, we cursed through sludge. That's a nice literal image. You get the idea of these guys just slogging through the muck and the mud. Sludge is a wonderful word. Um, so you get the idea of what their walking was like just through that one word, sludge. Um, we turned our backs. Um, trudge is a perfectly um, good literal word. Um, many had lost their boots but limped on. Um, that's a literal image. Um, bloodshot seems like it's figurative, but if you think of people who have been trapped in mucky, freezing trenches um, with trench foot, they are actually um, wearing blood for boots in some cases. So that's an image that works on both levels. And that brings us to the end of our second part of this Images and Imagery podcast. So we have looked at the ways in which images can be used and the difference between literal and figurative imagery. Now we're going to move on in part three to a closer look at figures of speech and the ways in which these can be used uh, in poetry. Um, so you get um, even greater variety to um, your poetry techniques, um, hopefully making for more richer, for more richer, for richer and more invigorating and involving work. See you in a few minutes.